Welcome back to the Skid Factory Quick Tech. Today we're going to talk about heat exchangers. Your average motor vehicle is full of heat exchangers. Uh, it's certainly a part of how they operate. All these things on the bench here and on the ground are all examples of, set of heat exchangers that are used in cars. Um, probably the most obvious that just about every car would have, other than some old Volkswagen that no one cares about, is a radiator for the coolant. There's an exploded view one from Oldcock that's had the, the tanks pulled off it. There's your average fully assembled unit out of a Commodore. Most people would know that the reason for a radiator is to dissipate the heat from the engine coolant to keep the engine at the correct operating temperature. So how, that, how it does that is the water pump circulates coolant around the engine. It um, transfers heat out of the engine block and heads and carries it in the engine coolant, which is water-based in general. It drops it down into this tank and it runs down through these tubes. So the coolant flow is obviously pretty slow. Those tubes are fairly small. So they, the coolant makes its way down. At the same time, there's air rushing through these tiny little fins or turbulators, or I'm sure there's plenty of names for it. Air goes through, heat transfer occurs again. So it's transferred out into the air. That maintains your temperature in your engine to whatever's specified by the thermostat and a whole other bunch of things that in the system. But that's a very good example of a heat exchanger. We're taking the heat out of the engine into the coolant. It's a medium to carry the heat to this heat exchanger, which is then dissipated and then it's recirculated. Other than the radiator, the cooling engine coolant, we have also a need to cool oil, either the engine oil or uh, alternatively the transmission fluid. Um, sometimes in a race car, you probably want to cool every oil, but we'll just talk about normal cars for the moment. So um, oil coolers for your transmission or your engine, um, common one that you'll find on most cars that have got automatic transmissions that are used for anything um, sort of heavy duty work like four wheel drives, that sort of thing for towing would have a cooler in this fashion, probably a lot bigger than that. Um, that's kind of a sort of a standard sort of Japanese design. It's like a stacked plate so they can make that cooler out of many stacks high you want to go. Um, that's actually used for an engine oil cooler in a Z32, I think it came out of. Um, but same sort of design. Oil flows in, flows down through the, the tubes, just a different type of construction. And these little fins then cool the oil with, from the air passing over it. Another way of doing it is to transfer the heat between the engine coolant and the oil. So that's, that's a fairly sort of common design for that. Again, inside here is a whole sort of a matrix of passages. The oil travels through it and the coolant travels through it as well, but they never meet and the heat is transferred. The thing about this sort of design is if the oil's hotter than the coolant, it'll equalise into the coolant. Again, the other way around, it will uh, transfer coolant heat into the oil. So one of the reasons why they use this design is because it will bring everything up to temperature more evenly and that helps um, prevent wear and things like that. So these are commonly removed and replaced with that sort of design. But they're, which is great when, you, when you're racing the car, you're sitting there warming it up, you're not using it. But in a modern everyday vehicle where your missus just jumps in it and tears off down the road at Mach 10, uh, 
this helps get everything to temperature at, 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 an, at an even rate rather than one thing heating up before the other or um, oftentimes a transmission will remain too cold if you put too big of a transmission cooler on it and that also affects it. So that's a sort of a transferring heat from one fluid into another. Eventually it's dissipated by the radiator. So this does load up the radiator more. So the radiator is still doing all the work even though it's transferring through two different um, fluids. Um, transmissions also use these. Uh, most of them aren't very good and they tend to split open and ruin transmissions, but I suspect that's probably more the construction of them than the, the design itself because this is off a 2JZ and I've never seen one of those fail. It's just junk cars. Probably the third most common set of heat exchangers in a car that you'll find is for the air conditioning system, if still fitted. If you've got an S13 Sylvia, you obviously won't have aircon anymore because you have to remove it. Probably not too many people care about air conditioning, but we'll, we'll explain how, sort of vaguely how it works um, in a car. So both of these units are heat exchangers. Um, this is the condenser. It is to cool what's being pumped out of the air conditioning compressor. And that causes a change of state. It's then pumped through to this, which is inside your car. That is the evaporator. That then, due to this, which again, I'm not gonna go into this too hard, but that's the TX valve. It causes a, another change of state in here, which then absorbs heat out of the inside of the vehicle. So they are heat exchangers, but they are used for a, a bit more of a specific purpose than um, just cooling. It's, um, it's to change the state of the gas to absorb or shed heat. On the topic of aircon, most cars have a heat exchanger like this. That's the heater core or heater matrix. Basically a miniature radiator. Just does exactly what the radiator does, except for it has a fan on it that blows air through the ventilation system. Um, again, if you've got an S13 Sylvia, this isn't connected. It's probably still in the dash, but you can't get at it easily to take it out, so it's still there. Now we're done with all the boring stuff, let's get onto the power adders. Intercoolers. That's not a very exciting one, that's just off some junk OEM thing like a Jeep or something like that. We've chopped the end off it here so we can have a look inside to see um, how they actually work. But the basis of it is, it's like a radiator, it's just configured a little bit differently to suit the volume of air going through it. So, so your turbo's here, hot air out of the turbo, it's being compressed so it's heated up because when you squeeze the molecules together, they rub together and then they create heat. It comes in here, it goes through all the fins, just like the water goes through a radiator and air runs through and it dissipates heat the same way. The big differences here are the volume of air going through it is exponentially larger than the water that's traveling or the coolant that's, or the oil or whatever that's traveling through on these other heat exchangers. So they have very large openings, you can see there. So this is a tube and fin intercooler. There is another type, it's called bar and plate. I'll show you in a sec. So basically a tube and fin is very similar to a, a normal car radiator. The difference is that the tubes are much larger, so they need to be able to carry the volume of air without restriction. And also they have actual turbulators or heat dissipators inside the tubes and radiators generally don't have that. Some of the new stuff does have that and um, we have sort of played around with them in Matt's LS R32 that we built. It had a BMW radiator in it uh, that actually was sort of built more like an intercooler to be more efficient at a smaller size. So 
this really helps get the uh, heat out of the air and transfer it across into these other fins that the, the ambient air is passing through. So that's how it works. It's very simple, but the devil's in the details. So when you're purchasing your eBay intercooler, the differences in quality are basically coming down to how these are designed, how dense it is, whether that affects cooling or goes the other way and restricts. It's a, it's a balance. So a restrictive intercooler will probably cool the air a lot better, but it also pulls power out of the engine by making the turbo work harder than it needs to do because it's restricting the flow of air through it. So quick look at a bar and plate. That's how a bar and plate intercooler is, is uh, assembled. So the bars are, this is actually a watered air intercooler, which we'll talk about in a second, but it's basically two opposites being stacked on top of each other rather than that design, which is built like a radiator. Um, this is very common. Uh, it's easy to produce and they do work quite well. Uh, it's just horses for courses. That's uh, up to you to choose which one you want to go with. These are very heavy. Um, they're a good heat sink because of the weight and because they're made of aluminium, whereas they are very light and um, flow air through them quite well. So the last thing we're going to talk about is water to air intercoolers. This is a, um, a prototype sort of thing that, from my Toyota turbo kit for the Toyota 86s that we have used to um, eventually make cast tanks out of, like that. This is a CNC tank, which sounds cool, but it's actually not as good as a cast tank as far as airflow goes. But because it's a cutaway, we can see how it works a lot better. So charge air cooling is commonly what they call watered air intercooling in some countries. It's also referred to as indirect charge air cooling in, by the OEMs. Um, and the reason for that is because the air is being cooled, the charge air so out of the turbo, up into here, goes through the core, out into the engine. It's not being cooled by air, it's being, the, the, the heat is being transferred into a coolant, which is generally just engine coolant. Uh, and then it, is pumped off to a radiator where it is then cooled by the air. So it, that's why they call it, refer to it as, as indirect because it's not being directly cooled by the air. It's via a cooling medium or a transfer medium. So the way they build these things is, it's very similar, but the difference is where the air would pass through to cool the charge air gets confusing now because we're talking about two types of air. So I'll, I'll refer to charge air as what's coming out of the turbocharger that's going into the engine. So the charge air goes in here and comes out here. The, normally you would have airflow, ambient air, cooling it on a normal intercooler, on air to air. In this case, we are using coolant. So the coolant is pumped through Inside here, this is this actual core. These are junk, by the way, don't buy them. That's why I've got 20 of them in a pile. Coolant runs through these smaller passages. Air runs through the larger passages. There's a transfer of heat, which is then transferred into the coolant, pumped around to a radiator. So another heat exchanger. This can have many forms. This is what our particular unit looks like. Um, it's basically just a, a thick radiator. Air flows through it, cools off the coolant. It continues on. So the biggest problem with these things are is it is very time consuming to get the right sizes of everything to 
make it actually work properly. Um, it is not as simple as just chuck the biggest water air to air intercooler on it you can find. That's easy. Put some pipes to it, off you go. Put it at the front so it gets the coolest air. This is a bit different. It is using coolant so you can have problems with heat soak in the coolant that you'll get to a certain temperature and you can never get it cooler. Uh, this radiator has to be very efficient. It has to be right at the front and it has to have airflow going through it exclusively. You can't let the air go around it because it will. Um, all these things I've learnt in the process. So it has its place and in my opinion its place is where air to air intercooling is not practical and that does occur. So supercharging with a positive displacement blower on the top of the engine. Nowadays very common to use air to air, water to air charge cooling. Getting confused now. Um, because it's in, within the design that you cannot move the air out to the front of the car and back in again. So they place cores similar to this underneath the supercharger or sometimes they pull in from the bottom and blow over the top. But that sort of thing then cools the charge air via coolant. So it has its place. Um, general S13 Sylvia stuff, you wouldn't use a water to air intercooler, you'd just use a 600 by 300 off eBay. It does work, but it is definitely more difficult to set up and is not any better, so to speak, but it just has its place in a packaging arrangement. That's it for today's Quick Tech. I hope we've given you a bit of an insight into how heat exchange works on a car. If you've got any good subjects for uh, Quick Tech, then you'd let us know in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Do you know how much that intercooler costs, bro? What's the retail on one of those? How much does it cost or how much is it worth? Well, that's very true. More Jeep parts, bro. What's going on? Can you see how we're chopping it up because it's useless? 